Are you sure? Here's the 30 second lesson on what legends know. Never ask a bride why she's getting married. Don't wear a skirt on a windy day. Deodorant is not a shower. Don't sniff chili flakes. <laughs> and don't forget, saving is not investing. Legends don't just save, they invest in mutual funds. Mutual fund investments are subject to market risks. Read all scheme-related documents carefully. The immigration officer knew the passport was fake. As fake as the story of torture the wiry young Algerian had told him while claiming asylum. Even then, Ahmad Rassam soon walked out of the airport onto the streets of Toronto. Even though his asylum application was rejected, Rassam was allowed to continue living in Canada, supplementing his welfare entitlements with shoplifting and stealing luggage from tourists. And even when Canadian intelligence learned he was providing stolen passports to Al-Qaeda, nothing happened. Finally, in December 1999, a suspicious United States customs officer at the Port Angeles border crossing pulled Rassam aside, thinking he might be trafficking narcotics. Inside the car, she found almost 50 kilograms of fertilizer and ethylene glycol dinitrate, intended to explode at millennium celebrations near Los Angeles International Airport. Last week, prosecutors in British Columbia began the trial of 20-year-old Mississauga resident Anand Nath, or Adnan, the name he chose to go by, with serving as a hitman for a jihadist cell. Together with Suleiman Raza and Nakash Abbasi, prosecutors allege, Nath shot dead his friend Naim Akal in the summer of 2021 to prevent him from exposing an operation to send funds to the Islamic State. The case establishes that organized crime-linked Khalistan terrorists aren't the only ones hiding in the shade of the maple leaf. Erratic law enforcement standards and political appeasement of the country's increasingly poisonous identity politics are providing jihadist groups with a safe haven. Entwined with gang culture, which already claims more civilian lives every single year than all of India's insurgencies put together, Canadian jihadism could pose a danger not just to the country, but also to the world around it. Early in the summer of 1975, the son of a provincial Egyptian civil servant arrived in Montreal, hoping to secure an engineering degree and Canadian citizenship. Saeed Ahmed Khadar had arrived in the West as an observant Muslim, but largely secular nationalist in his political outlook. At university, though, journalist Michel Shepard records, he ended up joining the Muslim Student Association, a group founded by the Muslim Brotherhood in 1963. The Brotherhood had set up branches across North America, and Khadr was just one of an expanding set of recruits. Khadr, though, was a special recruit. In key senses, he would lay the foundations for a jihadist movement to emerge in Canada. From a mosque in Munich, the Egyptian Islamist ideologue Said Ramadan had steered the growth of the Muslim Brotherhood in the West, as it fought for the transformation of its homeland into a theocratic state. The movement, which laid the foundations for the global jihadist organizations, was then an ally of the Central Intelligence Agency, journalist Ian Johnson has explained, serving to fight against Soviet communism and Arab nationalism. French author Caroline Forest has noted that Ramadan emerged at the vanguard of Islamist causes worldwide, with Pakistani Prime Minister Liaquat Ali Khan even giving him a regular slot on national radio. Even after he obtained an excellent position at Bell Northern Research, however, Khadir sought closer involvement in the theocratic movements which had swept Iran and Afghanistan in the 1970s. In 1982, he moved his family to Bahrain. Three years later, they shifted to Pakistan, where Khadr became part of the jihadist circle around Palestinian-born ideologue Abdullah Azam and his acolyte Osama bin Laden. Following the bombing of the Egyptian embassy in Pakistan in 1995, Khadr was arrested and sentenced to death. 
Faced with intense diplomatic pressure from Canada though, where Islamic groups relentlessly lobbied Prime Minister Jean Chrétien's government, he was released and fled back to Afghanistan. Qadir was later killed in a 2003 firefight with Pakistani forces, as were two of his sons. His teenage son, Omar, would spend a decade in Guantanamo Bay. Even though substantial evidence emerged of Omar's involvement in terrorism, he later won a $10.5 million payout from Prime Minister Justin Trudeau's government because of the role of Canadian officials in enabling his torture during interrogation. The networks of jihadist mobilization established through Khadr were soon making their presence felt. Fateh Kamel, who recruited Ressam to supply passports for Al-Qaeda, left Afghanistan for Canada in 1988, hoping to use his new homeland to help the jihad back in the East. French courts, which later had an eight-year sentence for an attack in the town of Roubaix, would describe him as, and I quote, the principal organizer of international networks determined to prepare attacks, procure weapons and passports for terrorists acting throughout the world. Led by Trinidadian convert Glenn Neville Ford, five members of the Pakistani jihadist group Jamaat al-Fukra, or Army of the Poor, plotted to bomb a Hindu temple and movie theatre in Toronto in 1991, at a time when an estimated 4,000 people were expected to gather there for Diwali celebrations. Ford twice travelled to Lahore to study at cleric Sheikh Mubarak Ali Gilani's International Quranic Open University, reporter John Goddard has written. The university was described by the FBI as a terror front. There, he studied Gilani's writings, including an exhortation, I quote, to lead Muslims to their final victory over the communists, Zionists, Hindus and deviators. In 1991, Ford followed Gilani's call to establish a rural collective to insulate the group's followers from Western culture. Then, to mark the fifth anniversary of 9-11, Zakaria Amara, a Jordanian Christian by birth who converted to Islam, led a group of 18 conspirators who plotted to detonate truck bombs in Toronto. The group scholars Michael King, David Jones and Amarnath Amarsingham have written, even hosted a convention of jihadists from the United Kingdom and United States in 2005. Five years later, in 2010, Afghanistan-trained Canadian jihadist Hiva Alizadeh, together with Ms. Bahuddin Ahmad and medical resident Khurram Sher, were held for plotting to set off a bomb in Ottawa. The group had also procured thousands of dollars to help jihadist groups in Afghanistan, investigators found. Three years later, Tunisian national Cheheb Esghayer, studying for a biotechnology doctorate in Canada, plotted to derail an intercity train. From soon after 9-11, King and his co-authors record, numbers of Canadians were moving to jihadist battlegrounds around the world, inspired by the Islamist cells operating at home. Farid Imam, Mohnad al farik and Miawan Diyar met while studying at the University of Manitoba and left Canada in 2007 with the intent of joining either Al-Qaeda or the Taliban. Estimates suggest some 180 Canadian nationals served with the Islamic State, of whom 80 have returned home. The scholar Kylie Matthews notes the country has been reluctant to prosecute its citizens for crimes they are alleged to have committed for the so-called caliphate. Little is known so far about what drew Anand Nath to the Islamic State. The son of immigrants living in the Toronto region, he worked in marketing at a warehousing firm together with several of his fellow accused. The firm owned by Abbasi, is believed to have been used to send funds to Canadians in the Islamic State in Syria. It is unclear when Nath, as well as his victim Akal, who was Druze by birth, converted to Islam. Prosecutors say the decision to kill Akal as well as his family was taken after he threatened to expose the operation to authorities. Like not, several other young Canadian jihadists have had past relationships with small-time crime or drug use. The vast majority of people who fit that profile, though, have not been drawn to jihadism. Even though some jihadists have been converts to Islam, others were not. 
There is no easy deterministic model that explains who becomes a terrorist and who doesn't. The political scientist Lorne Dawson has noted of the Toronto jihadists, however, that, and I quote, the young men appear to have come from secular, nominal, or at best, moderately religious backgrounds. Yet they were bound together by an intense, coherent religious rhetoric and sense of purpose. They strove to live out the Mujahideen ideal in their own fashion, mixing the catchphrases of Islamic fundamentalism with the lingo of gangster rap culture of urban youth. Like other violent youth clusters, Khalistani or plain vanilla drug dealing gangster, young alienated youth from immigrant backgrounds seem to find in jihadism a sense of the brotherhood, agency they lack in their communities and in their everyday lives. The conditions are ripe for fundamentalist and organized crime groups to flourish in. Years before 9-11, Canadian spymaster Ward Elcock warned his country could become known as a place from where, I quote, terrorist acts elsewhere are funded or fomented. We cannot ever become known as some rest and recreation facility for terrorists, Alcock said. In other words, and I will be as blunt as I can be, we cannot become through inaction or otherwise what might be called an official state sponsor of terrorism. Those are words Canadian intelligence services, police and politicians should be paying very close attention to. I'm Praveen Swami and I'm a contributing editor to The Print. Thank you for watching this episode of Security Code.